Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce our guest, Oliver Platt of One Soccer. He's been one of my uh, go-tos uh, watching the Canadian men's national team because uh, he's basically been and covering all of uh, their games on their run to the World Cup. So he's very knowledgeable, very insightful, insightful about uh, Canadian soccer. So I'm very excited to have him on. How's it going, Oliver? Good, thank you. How are you? Really good, really good. Um, I just wanted to start by asking you a little bit about how you kind of came to be in, in the industry and, and when did you first think about maybe pursuing a career in, in sports journalism or football journalism? Um, I usually, the way I tell this usually is that I like slowly eliminated jobs in sports that I couldn't do. So firstly, obviously it was a player and then I even did like some refereeing for a while and things like that and kind of just figured out that like, the, the subjects I could do in school, which I always, was really the only one I liked was was English and combines that with soccer. And it seemed like maybe trying journalism made sense. So I, I just started, um, you know, writing for student papers and things like that. Um, do, I took a couple of internships in while I was in college doing that kind of thing, write, writing for websites and so on. And, and then was lucky enough to to get a job out of college that, that took me into it. So that was kind of how I got started. And and when when you started you were in the UK is that correct and 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 how maybe why what how did it look how did your career begin in the UK and then how did it translate for you coming over to <clears throat> to Canada yeah I started in the UK um, I, I lived in Canada for a bit when I was a kid so that's where my connection to, to Canada mm -hmm. kind of comes from but I, I went back to the UK with my family um, in 2003 and went through rest of high school and, and college uh, in the UK um and yeah like I said I w when I was in college I got an internship with a website called goal.com which some people might know although it's not available strangely in Canada um is, is is a big soccer website um so I started working for them I was my college was in Norwich in England so I started covering Norwich City was my first kind of job there which was great I was you know like 19 20 years old and getting to do the Premier League so that that was amazing for me um and then, yeah, I, I did that kind of part time through college along with my studies and and ended up getting a job uh, full time after I graduated. So I kind of got my start there. And and then um, back in, in 2015, it was I, I just decided I kind of wanted a change. And I'd always kind of thought about coming back to Canada, um, had always wanted to do it at some point. So I decided to do a couple of years here and, and ended up never leaving. And I guess I just wanted to ask you a little bit how you came to One Soccer. It's, it's kind of been an up and coming, uh, I guess, media platform. And and how did you get your start there? Yeah, it was firstly, when I first came to Toronto, I, I kind of got into covering TFC. Um, so that was where I kind of got my way in and did that for a little while, just kind of on the side of, of what was my actual job, really. Um, but obviously, it was a really good time to cover TFC. Obviously, the, the team... Javinko joins Bradley Altador and so on and, and the team became very good very quickly and and won MLS Cup so that was great and I met a few people there obviously who you know went on to who were in Canadian soccer and covering Canadian soccer and went on to to be involved in the CPL um so firstly I was writing just on kind of a freelance basis for the CPL website when that first launched and the league was was first coming into being um, and then when one soccer was launched, which was extremely late, I don't know how many people remember, but it was, you know, literally like a, a couple of weeks before the first CPL game, it was still, the deal was still getting done. Um, so when that happened, I got asked if I would be interested, um, in, in a job with one soccer and in, in, initially nothing to do with being on air. I never thought I would be on air. It was more oh. just like kind of, you know, writing, doing research for, for people who were on air, doing interviews and, and things like that, kind of producing, um, you know feature content type stuff basically rather than being an analyst or, or anything like that so yeah I kind of got in that way um and yeah ended up ended up doing something quite different to what I was originally hired for but obviously it's been been an amazing experience and I was, I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time and what was it like going going on air for the first time and and how was that transition that must have been quite a interesting uh kind of way into into the industry yeah, it was strange. And like people who know me, I think we would never have expected me to be an on air personality. Like I'm quite a quiet person, keep myself to myself most of the time. So it was definitely an adjustment. But like what I was really fortunate with at One Soccer was firstly, the people there have been amazing for me. Like there's been so many people who have been hugely supportive and give me opportunities 
you know, people who are like Andy, for example, who's incredibly established in the industry and the best in Canada for me are what she does, um, who didn't need to take any interest in me whatsoever, but did, right? And, and I'm, I'm very lucky for that. Um, and then the second thing was also that just because it was kind of a small startup channel, there was a lot of room for you to kind of get reps, basically, um, mm -hmm. and not be very good in the first year, which I, I was terrible. Um, but just keep doing it right and, and start to kind of develop and figure it out and, and get a little bit better and keep going. So I, I, I was, you know, really lucky to, to be in a place that was willing to, you know, give opportunities to someone who'd never done it before, kind of let him figure it out on the fly, which, which I did and, and hopefully get a bit better, for, better at it from there as I went and, you know, just kind of grow with the channel, I guess. And I guess as the channel's grown and, and obviously Canada's made the world cup, obviously they've been amazing on the women's side, winning the gold last year, but I guess as you, uh, as someone in the industry, are you optimistic that there will be more jobs and pathways for journalists in Canada after this world cup? I really hope so. Yeah. I, I still think it's kind of underserved. Um, you know, it's, it's still the, the reality of it in Canada now is still small. Um, I think people, you know, see what's happening on the one side where you have a gold medal women's team and a World Cup men's team and and expect this kind of explosion in coverage and so on. And it hasn't really happened yet. It's obviously picked up a lot from where it's been in, in previous years. But, you know, one soccer is still a very small operation, I think smaller than, than a lot of people think. There's still only a handful of people, you know, in, in, in other media, uh, kind of the big networks or the newspapers or whatever it may be, who, who are actually able to cover soccer full time. And that's kind of basically always been the story. Like I, I think back to when I was covering TFC and pretty much everyone bar one or two people in that press box were doing soccer because they wanted to do it in their right. extra time rather than it was kind of their full-time job. Right. So that's still kind of the case. Um, I do think a world cup is, is obviously a game changer in 2026, even more so. So hopefully we'll start to see that change. Um, Definitely kind of the, the demographics of the country are changing towards soccer. And, and we've seen that in, in the way the teams have developed. I'm not sure the media has quite got there yet. It's still a bit older and, and you know, very much tilted to, to hockey and, and things like that. So hopefully in time, but it, but it will take time. And I think it's probably a slower process than, than people like. I guess I wanted to ask you before I ask about the women's national team, just a little bit about what it was like at one soccer as um as the team just went on that ride of, of making the world cup and did that kind of correspond into viewership and I guess attention and maybe for you more people asking you for interviews and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it was pretty incredible because, you know, we, we knew that once we, they did the deal to put the games on sports net, that that was going to be a big deal for us and, and really important, I think for the team, like there's no escaping it. And, and one soccer wants to be on on linear TV, as everyone knows, right? There's no escaping that the numbers are bigger on TV than they are on streaming. Um, so to, to get that was was really important. But then even even knowing how important that was, we didn't then expect what happened, right? Which was like, you know, a million and a half people or whatever it was watching Ice Tecca, which are numbers that compare to like the leaps and, and stuff like that. That was that was something that I think blew everyone away. So um that hopefully showed the potential of it um it's, it's still one where it kind of it kind of came together by by chance and by things falling into place at the right time rather than you know um people maybe really investing in canadian soccer and and you know seeing that that potential in in the way that we see it but hopefully that's something that indicates going forwards and, and we saw it with the women at the olympics as well that when these teams are playing in important games and and, and really representing the country on big stages it's, it's a national story and, and there's tons of people that get behind it. So hopefully that, that, you know, starts to lead to, to more interest and more investment going forwards. I guess to, as you mentioned, the women's team, I wanted to ask you about it. And, and they've, they've just been drawn in group B of the world cup with Ireland, Australia, Nigeria. What are your expectations for this woman's side who, who just won the Olympics last year but um probably aren't kind of, probably aren't favorites to win the world cup what what do you think is uh, a good result or good performance for for the women's team at next year's world cup i think you you just like to see improvement particularly on 2019 right where it started to feel like you know europe was was moving very fast in one direction and maybe canada was was starting to to drag a little bit in the other one um and Bev Priestman's come in and started to correct that a little bit I think playing more to the team's strengths understanding the team's strengths and you know that we, we I don't think we feel 
so much concern as we did after that 2019 World Cup that we're going one way and the rest of the world is going another. But at the same time, like I, I, I do think that the investment in Europe has been massive. Um, there's obviously established clubs and, and soccer cultures there, which which helps as well. Um, there's some really deep teams and, you know, teams with resources and with their own league and so on and, and lots of things that Canada doesn't have. Um, but I think, you know, as, as as much as the World Cup is a, is a more difficult tournament and obviously a longer tournament, you know, Canada showed at the Olympics that one, one to 15 or 16 or however many players you want to take, they're, they're still a top class team, right? So we, we can talk about in the long term, certain things I do think need to happen. So to keep Canada at that level, we need a league, we need development to improve, we need all of these different things to to get a deeper pool of players in the long run if we're going to keep up with, you know, England and Spain and, and Germany and countries like this. But right now, I I still think they have the team to be competitive. So hopefully, it's, I, I think, you know, expecting them to go and win it is, is a real big ask. But being competitive in the knockout stage, looking like a team that's more of a threat to win it than they did in 2019, I think that would would be you know that would be the expectation for me. And and you mentioned a women's uh, a women's professional league. Do you think Canada is close to getting that? Is that anything do you th- that's on the horizon, or is that still maybe a couple years, or hopefully not too long, but maybe a bit uh, farther away? I think we're close. Um, I don't know exactly what it looks like yet, but, and, you know, I, those, there's definitely still things behind the scenes being worked out, I think, in, in terms of, you know, how that's going to be led, what it will look like, but it's it's closer than people think. Like there, okay. there's, def, there's definitely things happening. It's, it's not for me to, to, to say or reveal no, no. in some cases, because, because obviously that the right time will come for that, for the, for the people who are, you know, kind of working on that, but it's, it's not, like I can promise people that it's not stagnant behind the scenes. Like there's definitely things moving and, and people working very hard to make that happen. So I think my, people might be pleasantly su- surprised by by how close that is. And I guess just my last follow-up is how important do you think that would be for Canada? Do you think that would almost put them in a, in a place where they're top three, four in the world? I mean, they have been, but more at that mm. upper en- echelon of, of world-class teams. Yeah, it would be massive. It wouldn't be an overnight transformation because it's something you, you'd need to build. But I always, I think people sometimes underestimate what a league could, a women's league could be in Canada. Like there's a tendency to just think, well, it's, it's a female version of the CPL and there's nothing wrong with the CPL. And I think that can go a long way as well. But the big difference is, is that the CPL is coming into a world where there's a hundred professional men's leagues or whatever, right? And And some of them have been around for a century and you know, you look at the money in the Premier League and La Liga and, and even in MLS, and, and it's going to take a long time for us to to kind of catch up to, to everyone else. Um, in the women's game, it's a completely different landscape. Like you're, you're competing with a handful of diff- of leagues, right? And, and Canada's a country that's established in the women's game. We've always had a top class women's team, national team, unlike the men. Um, it's a, We're a well-resourced country, um, you know, that, that has the capability to make this happen. There's, there's a lot more kind of, immediate potential of of Canada being able to to punch with the very best leagues in the world early on um on the women's side than there is on the men so I, I think people shouldn't underestimate you know how good that league could be and and, and, how, and how important it will be for for the future of, of the national team as well and I think uh a lot of this has come up with the CSA which is the Canadian Soccer Federation and it's I guess, relationships with the men's and women's national teams and and the men's team went on strike. And there's obviously discontent amongst the women's team as well. Um, I wanted to just ask, what are your thoughts about the CSA? And do you think it's, especially what's happened recently with with the men's and women's national team, do you think they'll have a significant maybe negative effect on how maybe a, a professional league grows for women and just maybe even how it affects the men's team at the World Cup? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, it's not the CSA's job to start a league. So, you know, I, I don't see them being super involved in that. Obviously, they support it in certain ways, um, but their focus is is really on on the national teams, on grassroots, on, on all of those different things. Um, look, I, I think what, what I always come back to on this is, is that the CSA is like a really small organization, right? It's been kind of a an organization that's much more comparable to kind of very small minority sports than it is, you know, comparable to hockey Canada or basketball or, or whatever the case may be. And it's kind of had this absolute shell shock of suddenly we've won a gold medal at the Olympics and suddenly we're going to the world cup for the first time in 36 years. Um, and we can be, 
competing you know on, on on the global stage with all of these massive teams and they just weren't ready for it right uh, they weren't ready for it in terms of you know the the compensation agreement they had with the players and suddenly all these things are being you know re-examined in terms of you know what are we getting from from kit sales and what are we getting in terms of bonus money like it, it just hadn't been thought about before uh, because it didn't need to be because we were talking about much smaller figures and much less success so um, it's been a bit of a shock to the system for them, I think. Um, obviously, now they, they've got to find a way out of it. And first and foremost, they've got to rebuild trust in, in whatever way they can, because clearly between the, the Federation and the players, that, that's kind of been lost. Um, but I think we, we, will, we will come through it and get out of it. And I would urge people not to forget, you know, when, when, when you look at where we were in just in 2017, 2018, compared to where we are now, where you know, we've got that gold medal, we're going to the World Cup, we've got a men's league, the women's league is on the way, like we've made so many strides. So as much as I, I, I get everyone's frustration and, and, and the the feeling sometimes that you want to blow it all up, like you've got to keep your eye on the bigger picture here and, and, and remember that we are making progress. And I think we'll continue to do so if we all pull in the same direction. And I guess probably, I mean, I don't want to take away from the women's winning, winning the gold medal, but in terms of probably financial and and everything with the men's team going to the World Cup next week. Um, how kind of important has that been, do you think, uh, in terms of just generating that interest? And and what what was it like for you just to cover that team? And, and what were some of your most fondest memories? Yeah, it was incredible. Um, uh, there, there was a ton of memories that you could pick out, I think. Um, you know, Davies scoring against Panama was was definitely a highlight. That was that was that was the night where it all kind of really went to the next level in terms of the attention the team was getting in the country. Um, but th there's a few, like e e even going down to Azteca, like on a personal level, that was obviously a bucket list one for me to be able to travel for that game and and be in that stadium. But also just seeing how Canada performs, like you you were watching this team against Mexico in one of the the most famous stadiums in world soccer, and they just looked totally unconcerned or unintimidated in in any way like they they played incredibly fearlessly so th there's a bunch of moments that you can go through but yeah it was it was a pretty incredible journey um incredible obviously to have all but one qualifier in the octagonal and, and to be able to cover it all the way um and yeah in in, in terms of you know you're right that you know rightly or wrongly and, and obviously we we'd want to see more world cup prize money and, and more investment in the women's game but right now the reality is that the the big money is in the men's game right and so i think john herdman said it himself when he made that decision to come over from from the women's team to the men's team was the way we take this program to the next level in terms of investment is is to get to a men's world cup and yeah it's, it's been pretty transformative already and i think it just even more so in the coming years up to 2026 well you you really helped me because my next question was about john herdman and i wanted to <laughs> I wanted to to ask just I know that you said that John Herdman changed the course of Canadian soccer and I wanted to ask how did he do that? Um it's a good question. I I think like it's his personality as much as anything. Like he's he's intense, right? Like I I have don't think I've ever really seen a coach who has as much attention to detail um who obsesses over every little thing that's that's within his power um and and you kind of you kind of get that sense when you know when when you see coaches at the top level like I, I covered the premier league for a little while you you get this in, and players as well you get the sense that some of them are on a different different kind of level mentally in terms of their intensity in terms of you know just just focusing on every little tiny thing um compared to mere mortals like us right like they're, 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 they're a different type of person and herdman is in that category i think um so it's it's that kind of that kind of personality that i think has done it and it's a combination of you know thinking big and and not being limited in in terms of his ambition and in terms of what he wants to achieve but then also there's no question as well beyond the the work he does as a coach that he builds uh incredible relationships with the players you know they they will will go to war for him you still hear you know, Christine Sinclair was was doing a, an interview recently where she was talking about it, you know, the, the connection that he builds with the players, the way he kind of understands, I think, how players tick. Um, you, you see another example of it, I think, with the way he talked about Daniil Henry yesterday yeah. when he was discussing leaving him out of the squad. And, and when you hear him talk about that, like, 
talk about Daniil like that, you kind of start to understand why these guys will will do anything for him, right? Like in in, in terms of that bond he's built. So yeah, it's it's that combination I think of of just being so driven and so intense and and having an unbelievable work ethic combined with his ability to you know emotionally understand people and understand the players and 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 really get them you know really kind of get them pushing in all in the same direction which is is a difficult thing to achieve and and he pushed them in the right direction to the, make the world cup which is just incredible and i wanted to know that the 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 roster was released yesterday and i wanted to know what your initial pr- impressions were any surprises or omissions that caught your eye as well I don't think it was massively surprising. Like I think the only one I was kind of waiting to find out on was was whether Henry would be fit or not, and if if not, who would come in. And I, I suspect it was Liam Fraser. I, obviously, we don't know who would have been off if if Henry had made it, but I, I think that was probably the late change. So I don't think we're in, we're in a place yet in in terms of the, the national team where um, they necessarily have the depth to have too many yeah. really difficult decisions around the fringes of the, of the roster. I think it's pretty established and. Herdman as well has, has kind of managed it like a club team, right? He's he's committed to a group of guys who um, have taken him through qualifying and, and we're always going to be there in Qatar. How important do you think the Canadian Premier League, which you, you cover, has been in, in producing more of those depth players for Canada uh, for the senior men's national team? Well, it's, it's definitely helped already. Um, you know, to have Joel Waterman there, I think is is pretty incredible for a four-year-old league um so i've already produced a, a world cup player an international player and lucas mcnaughton got his debut as well obviously against bahrain which is great um so i think it's already helped to build out depth but where i really see it making the biggest difference is like the next generation of players yeah. i think the the kids who are 16 17 18 now you're already starting to see them in the cpl um they're the players that I think that are going to probably get their start there. And, 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 you know, some will still go the MLS route, some will still go abroad, but there's a lot of players and, and some players who maybe would have been missed um, who who will, will get their chance in the CPL, get the opportunity to play regularly, at, you know, every single week in, in, in senior, senior football. Um, and it's just a, it's just a great thing to have in terms of firstly, giving more players opportunities, but secondly, also being a safety net for, for guys who maybe just need a, a couple more years, right. And don't progress quite as quickly as others in, in, in MLS academies or whatever. And you can see that with someone like Baloo Tabla, right. Who, yeah. you know, kind of has a, has a difficult few years, gets released by Montreal. And, and if that had happened and the CPL is not there, I'm not sure what happens to Baloo, right. I'm not sure where he goes next, but now, He's able to to kind of just reset a little bit, find a foundation, and and I think now could could go back to a higher level and potentially go back into international team contention. And and I just wanted to transition a little bit to they play a game this week against Japan before the World Cup, and and you said this was a bit of a benchmark game for Canada. What do you want to see from Canada in this game against Japan? Well, I think it's like it's it's close to the start of the tournament so it's it's a difficult one but it's still a really vital opportunity i think to progress the performances against top teams like japan's a world cup team they could be a knockout stage team they're in a tough group so we'll we'll, we'll see but they have that kind of quality um and that's kind of like when, when i talk about canada's chances in qatar like i think the biggest thing holding them back is just that they haven't played enough of these teams yeah. Um, like we saw against Uruguay that they can be competitive, but there's a difference between being competitive and then turning encouraging performances into actual results, right? Like being clinical in front of goal in these moments, shutting down world-class players like that, I think is probably where they're going to come up short if I'm being realistic rather than really hopeful in, in Qatar. So every game they get, every experience they get against an opponent like this, I think is super valuable. So like I said, it's, it's one that comes right before the tournament, so you don't necessarily have a ton of time to dissect it and, and learn from it. But just all the minutes they can get against these kinds of opponents, I think, is is going to make the team better and, and improve their chances of, of of causing an upset at the World Cup. You mentioned that you you think they might not be as clinical as, as some of these teams that are a bit higher in the world and just they haven't played enough of those teams themselves. Do you think having the quality of a of Davies, David, and and I guess you can say Eustachio, uh, Buchanan almost mitigates them in, in a tournament style format where they have those kind of game breakers to 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 nick a goal when they really need it out of nothing? 
Yeah, that, that's the hope, right? That's what you would hang on to, I think, if you're trying to make a case for Canada causing causing an upset against a team like Belgium or Croatia or or whoever, um, is that they have players in certain players in in kind of X factor positions who who could be difference makers. Um, like you look at you look at the the back line for Belgium as good of a of a team as they are, they've got you know some older players at this point in in Alderweireld and Vertonghen who have gone back to the Belgian league. They've got some very good young players as well, but they don't necessarily have a ton of defenders who are kind of in the peak years of their careers and playing at the top level. Um, Canada in attack is going to be able to roll out a Bayern Munich player and a Lille player and, and someone in Buchanan who, you know, I think could go to that level as well. So that that's where you're, you're kind of looking at and, and, and thinking if Canada can, you know, can cause any kind of upset here is their ability to match up their best players against maybe some, some of the weaknesses of the opponent. Um but it's still, you know, that's only obviously part of the game and, and the rest of that Belgian team, the midfields, the options they have in attack, it's going to be incredibly difficult. So they're, they're underdogs for sure, but you're right that that's kind of the, the the one thing that makes you believe a little bit that they could do something here is that they do have these these X-Factor players who, who could be difference makers. And I guess, personally, what would what would for you be a, a realistic expectation for Canada? Is it to get a result is it to make it out of the group what do you think is a real like realistic expectation for canada um i, th- I think we'd all have to see them win a game right like that would be the starting point for me is uh, you know morocco is is a team that shouldn't be un- underrated by any means and they're probably on paper still a better team than canada even if they don't have a, a player as good as davies necessarily um, but you feel like they can they can be competitive in that game. You feel like obviously that they're, they're going to give it everything they've got to to cause an upset against Belgium or Croatia. Um, if they can get a win, I think that's that's going to be a fantastic moment for for the country. And whatever happens aside from that, that will feel like a, a pretty big success. But generally speaking, I I just want to see them go and hold their own, right? Like you you just don't want to see them kind of get blown out or, or look like they don't belong, which I don't think they will. But you, you, you want to see them continue kind of the fight we've seen in qualifying where where they can go up against teams that on paper have more quality and, and defy the odds a little bit. And I guess who is who do you think is the most important player for Canada if they are to to get that win and at uh next week's World Cup? I think it's gotta be Davies. Uh you know, I know it's the obvious one, but I, I think everything is is gonna go through him. Um and we we just talked about this on on the show we taped today a little bit. Like I think with Davies as well He's still, in some ways, learning to to play as a forward. So obviously, it's not where he plays for for his club. He's learning when to make the right decision, when to when to try and take someone on or two or three people on, when to hand the ball off to to someone else. Um, that's I still think is a learning process for him. And when he gets it right, we saw in the Uruguay game when he makes the right decision, it often means chance for Canada, right? And, and and good things happen. When he doesn't, it can mean a turnover, it can mean a counter attack, and it can swing completely the other way. So I think his his ability, like not to try to do too much but at the same time you, you don't you almost don't want to tell Davies that don't try to do too much because you do want him to try some things right you do want him to to, to be creative and, and and try to be a difference maker but it's just getting that balance right between you know when when to maybe take the easier option and when to try something that's a bit more difficult is is there a player on on this national team that might play a little bit that most people don't really know but really should k- kind of look for and, and be excited for Ooh. That's a good one. Um, I think probably I don't know how many people don't know him at this point because he's obviously rising very very quickly. But Kone is the one who comes to to mind for me, right? Like I think maybe if you haven't been watching much of Montreal this season, he's still relatively new to you. Um, but he he's an exciting player. He's the one for me when when you look at this team now in terms of who's going to be the next guy who who goes to Europe, who goes to a high level who makes himself a core part of this national team going forwards over the next few years, I, I think it's him. So um, we'll see what kind of role he has in terms of how much trust Herdman feels at this stage. He's 20 years old. He's in his first year as a pro. It's kind of come out of nowhere. So what what kind of role he gets exposed to, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I think he's he's incredibly talented and, and will go a long way. Him and Nustakio would sound really nice if uh, both in their yeah. uh, 2026. But uh, I, I wanted to ask just a little bit before I ask maybe about the first game against Belgium is what do you think is Canada's biggest weakness going up against these more, um, these better teams at the World Cup? 
Um, I think it's probably their ability to survive periods of pressure that they're going to have to survive um, and then release that those periods of pressure at times as well. Like it's easy to say, well, you know, we're just going to defend deep and play on the counter attack, but trying to do that for 90 minutes is really difficult. Uh, I don't think they'll want to do that, but by the way, either. I think they'll want to have periods where they have the ball and try and press a bit higher and try and be really brave in, in ways that people might not expect them to. But certainly you, you, you've got to have some quality to be able to do that, to be able to, you know, make good decisions when you're playing out from the back, to be able to make good decisions when when you're choosing to, to press higher up the pitch and not leave a load of space behind you. You need to be able to do that, I think. I don't think you can just park park yourself on the edge of the box for, for the whole game and, and survive against teams like this. They just have too much quality. Um, but it's finding finding the, the right moments to do that and, and then having the quality to do it as well to, to just kind of relieve the pressure a little bit and give your defense a breather for, for 10 or 15 minutes. So Canada plays Belgium in almost a week from now. What would your starting 11 be for Canada in, in their first game? Assuming uh, for this, uh, I'll just uh, caveat that Davies is 100% fit. Okay. Um, Boyan in goal, obviously. I think I'd go where well, the back three will be Johnston, Vittoria, and Miller. I don't think there's much question about that. Um, I'd have Adekubi on the left. And then prob- probably what I think or, or what I suspect is is the big selection decision along with the midfields is is the right wing back whether it's Hoylet or Larea or potentially even Buchanan I, I think Buchanan will play further forwards but I'll go I'll go Hoylet at right wing back um Eustachio and I'm gonna say Hutchinson in central midfield but obviously we'll, we'll see against Japan what kind of kind of match fitness he's in uh and then David Davies and Buchanan up front I think with with Lyron available off the bench would be my prediction and uh and i guess my my kind of last question or just to to end off is um who do you think is going to score the first goal for canada at the world cup um let's go with jonathan david i think he seems like the obvious answer right with with the form he's in um yeah canada's going to need jonathan david to be very good so I'll, i'll take the take david for that one and uh, so thanks so much for coming on. And I really appreciate this, Oliver. I just wanted to know, is there anything at One Soccer that people should keep their eyes open for or anything that uh, is coming up in, in the future? Yeah, so obviously we've got the Japan game on, on Thursday. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And then we'll be doing a show every single day through the through the World Cup, which I'm sure people will be hearing about pretty soon. So yeah, we're excited, obviously, for the tournament. And yeah, it's going to be a pretty special month. Hopefully Canada's in it for as, as long as possible, but whatever happens, it's going to be fun. Well, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Oliver, and uh, have a great time at the World Cup. Thanks, Alex.